We had earlier tried to do this in older children, 14, 15, 16 year olds, but what we discovered was by then it was already too late. Behaviors had already been ingrained and it was really difficult for kids that age to change their diet and lifestyle and make a lasting impression on their, on their body weight. So we attempted to try to do this in younger kids. It worked pretty well. Carlos came in, he learned a lot about how to eat better and eat healthier foods. A physical activity uh, program was started by his PE teacher and after about a year when our meager funding ended, he had actually lost about five pounds and was doing much better. But as he and his two overweight parents were walking out the door on the last day, and his already chubby five-year-old sister was going along with them, I overheard them talking about which fast food restaurant they'd go to for a celebratory lunch. We have a problem. Obesity and overweight is global now. Already there are, the World Health Organization estimates there are 700 million individuals who are overweight or obese. That represents twice the population of the United States plus France. And this problem has actually cost in US dollars over $3 billion, and that's just in adults. In children, unfortunately, we have a similar problem, and the rates are increasing equally, if not more so. 20 years ago, it was impossible to find children who were young enough to have uh, type 2 diabetes and dis diseases of that sort that are usually common in older people. Now it's very routine. And just last week in the uh, Journal of the American Academy of Pediatrics, it was estimated that about $19 million of extra health care costs accompany the raising of a child who is overweight. It unfortunately leads to premature hypertension, high blood cholesterol, blood glucose, et cetera, which really makes it difficult not to mention all of the emotional and psychological problems that accompany obesity in a child. This is a real problem, and of course there's been a huge interdisciplinary effort going on from a research perspective, looking at everything from basic science to clinical translational research and everything in between the biology, psychology, pharmacology, epidemiology, is all trying to come together to work on this problem. But we're really making very little headway. Even Michelle Obama, as you just heard, is trying to get into the, uh, increasing the awareness and the vision of this with her Let's Move campaign. But while small little changes have been made, the lasting ability to really make an in-depth uh, effort to make this change just seem to be resistant. Not only that, but once obesity is established, it's very difficult to reverse it. And even when you do, those who have made those uh, changes find it very difficult to sustain that. I was familiar with uh, consequences of overweight. It runs in my family. So even in high school, I sort of thought about trying to avoid those. I was a competitive swimmer and then a long distance runner. And, when I uh, started my career as a dietitian in a local Chicago hospital, it uh, occurred to me very quickly that most of the patients I was dealing with didn't need to be there. Had they been following a better diet and having a better lifestyle, they really could have avoided or at least delayed the onset of their diseases. So it was about at that point I decided I really wanted to focus on prevention. And when I was doing my doctoral research in a boarding high school, looking at sodium and blood pressure in normal healthy kids, we used a crossover design. So we had half the kids go on a lower sodium diet for about a month, and then they were supposed to switch and the other kids would go on the diet. This study uh, really raised very interesting new uh, inf information for me. The results show that after just one month, the kids that were on the lower sodium diet couldn't go back. They couldn't eat the higher sodium diet they had been eating all along. It totally ruined the study design, but it taught me something very important, which is that with a little bit of encouragement and ongoing effort, you can really make a change and have that be everlasting. The school made changes in their menus and the kids are still eating a lower sodium diet and not complaining about it. So it's something that can be done. Well, since then, I've had a couple of kids of my own. They're both in their 20s now. 
both thankfully still eating healthy diets and managing to keep up with physical activity as much as possible in their busy lives. But they don't obsess about it, they just view it as a day-by-day -day kind of effort. So this is the thing I think is really important as far as being able to move ahead and having additional questions go forward. One of the things that has changed since then is the whole area of genetics. Science is showing us that the previous uh, mentality that we had about it being energy balance, energy in, energy out, it's still true that you need a deficit in terms of the calories that you take in compared to the calories you put out in order to have a weight loss. But we're finding that it's not necessarily a one-size-fits-all formula. There are definitely times in your life where things can actually be changed. And there's a new whole area called epigenetics that is looking at areas that environmentally can shift gene expression. Areas, especially during times like pre-adolescence and also in utero before birth, when that environment can really make a difference as far as altering gene expression and modifying and imprinting your predisposition for certain risks. We used to think uh, that when you were obese or body fat was just dormant. Uh, it increased your pant size, but it really didn't do much else. Now we recognize that obesity or adipose tissue actually has lots of feedback mechanisms. It, it offers and signals hormones and other factors like leptin and ghrelin and adiponectin that actually influence the, and trigger other risk factors for things like cardiovascular disease. But what's very interesting is while we recognize that obesity breeds obesity um, and that if you are obese going into a pregnancy, let's say, the likelihood of having obese children is much increased, the epigenetic data show us that that may not necessarily be true. Take, for example, bariatric surgery or gastric bypass, as it's called. A woman who has a child after a gastric bypass has a child who is less likely to develop obesity than that same woman who has a child before gastric bypass. That's really exciting because it illustrates that indeed the environment can shift some of those otherwise genetic predispositions for certain problems. So that's a really important thing. What we recognize, however, though, is that, of course, there are examples where skinny people have overweight children and vice versa. And besides, don't we also know that there are times in life where you can, in fact, embark on a, a weight loss diet and wind up being successful? You all are familiar with the celebrities who have <clears throat> managed to do this over the course of time. But the problem is, this is not the norm. <laughs> These are exceptions, and unfortunately, on the average, the majority of overweight children become overweight parents, and this cycle seems like it would continue for on and on. Let's look at the facts. At this point in time, the U.S. Dietary Guidelines Advisory Committee reported that we eat 400 calories more per day as a country than we did even 30 years ago. And the majority of these calories, in fact, the number one source of calories in the U.S. diet today is grain-based desserts, you know, cookies, pie, cake, things of that sort. And in children, it's sugar-sweetened beverages plus the snacks and desserts and pizza that make up 33% of their caloric intake every day. That unfortunately means that they're getting extra fat, extra salt, extra sugar, but not the very vitamins and minerals and nutrients they need in order to grow and develop normally. You can see how that would contribute to the obesity problem. So what do we do about all of this? Well, as you heard, the answer may just be mom. We recognize that there are data now showing that in fact the uh, Institute of Medicine has recommended that instead of the usual uh, recommendations about pregnancy that were typically made, that now if a woman is overweight or obese going into pregnancy, the recommendations for weight gain are smaller. So for an overweight mom, it's a recommendation of 15 to 25 pounds, and an obese mom, 11 to 20 pounds. 
This is something that can be achieved, and there have been some changes made in the whole approach to this. But unfortunately, when the IOM, the Institute of Medicine, just met recently in 2013, what they reported was that the rates of overweight continue to grow to the point where now women in their reproductive years, two-thirds of them are overweight, and 50% of them are obese. So it's time to really do something about helping moms to make these changes in their weight gain goals and try to achieve those results. So how can we do that? Well, it's a matter of crossing paths. It's a matter of taking primary care providers and obstetricians and pediatricians and working together in ways that help to foster these changes in lifestyle that really need to be made. It's a matter of shifting that attention to the nutrient-based fruits, vegetables, whole grains that give you the very vitamins and minerals that you can't get anywhere else in your diet. If you miss these foods, you're denying yourself of the very things that help you be healthy. So the other point is to look at where do we start? Well, women by divine design are created to breastfeed. And believe it or not, it used to be questioned whether breast milk was the very best thing for babies to eat. I'm happy to tell you we've now recommended that yes, it, that, that is absolutely true. And not only for the anti-inflammatory benefits that we have all, always known are important and also the anti-allergenic issues that seem to be helpful, but the fact that breastfeeding also seems to have protective effects in terms of weight control, not only for the mom, because breastfeeding takes energy, and if she can continue to follow her diet and lifestyle, she can actually lose weight more quickly, but also for the baby. And in fact, to delay the onset of solid foods, which typically are offered at younger and younger ages, and to withhold a solid food till at least four to six months of age, allowing for breastfeeding to take place until then, assures that child, or at least gives that child, the very best chance of being able to maintain a normal, healthy weight throughout their lifestyle. So the goal here in an ideal world is to have a mom enter pregnancy at a normal weight, to learn how to follow a diet and lifestyle behavior that not only she can follow throughout pregnancy, but that she can role model for her family once that baby is born and the other kids come along. It's a matter of working with her universe, working with her primary care provider and the dad and the family and that well-meaning society that wants to continue to tell her that she's eating for two, um, where we usually remind her that indeed she is, but the second one has a stomach the size of a lentil. Um, <laughs> so we need to keep that in mind as we move forward with that. But the goal here is for mom to have an opportunity to recognize that she can be the change agent, and we all need to support her in order to make that happen. Go mom. <laughs> Thank you.